Welcome to Arts with Nations, the podcast is for non-artists, artists, and everyone in between. We talk about art and try to explain what we think about it and as artists why we think that way. We ask questions to try and bridge the gap between viewer and creator to make the art world more accessible to everyone. Hello everybody and welcome back to the conversation. I am Andrew Malcheski and with me is... Joanna Bolsons. I was trying to mess with you. More Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back to the conversation. <laughs> uh, Joanna, of course, is talking about the microphone stand. <laughs> Just trying to get comfy, guys. Yeah, we are here on a wonderful Sunday afternoon with cups of tea all around, mm-hmm. ready to have another wonderful discussion. Um, this time, we might do a couple different topics depending on how much we actually have to say about them. Yeah, we had a few ideas of what to talk about, but we weren't sure they could fill an entire episode. So, we're just going to see what happens. Yeah. Um, the first thing that we kind of wanted to touch on is, is it worthwhile to buy name brand goods as an artist? And I want to make a distinct difference between name brand and quality. Yeah. Because there is there is a distinct difference between that. If I am a jewelry maker, it doesn't matter what name brand I buy as long as I get a good quality metal for my materials. Well, and, and I think that's the point of buying name brand is you're paying for the name and the name stands for quality. Or it should. It should. Um, I think the the first one we should talk about are Bob Ross paints because mm-hmm. I think that's Bob Ross is instantly recognizable as like a persona in the art world amongst you know not just artists but also um, most anybody who grew up when we did thanks to his Joy of Painting series right. and he has a line of paints and goods out there and I know you have some of that stuff. Yeah. Um... To me, there's no difference between between Bob Ross and Winton, and you're paying for the Bob Ross name. Yeah. Bob Ross is more expensive. Um, and we live in a capitalist society, so that's just good marketing. Yeah. You know? Um, now, if I was to try to choose between, like, um, Windsor Newton versus maybe Winton, I might go for Windsor Newton. They are a little more high quality, and you're not so much paying for the name, but you're paying for the quality, like you said. Yeah, yeah. So, in that comparison, you're talking about Windsor, Newton, and... Winton. Winton. Um, and what's the, the main difference in the quality between those two? Just the way the paint kind of glides across the canvas or across the panel board, whatever you're working on, the way the paint works with your either palette knife or your brush it's kind of like the difference between the basic acrylic the kind you can get in a tube versus the kind you get in the little bottles Mm. if you get the more expensive nicer basic acrylic you're gonna have a gloss to it it's gonna glide a lot more yeah whereas if you get those little bottles that are craft acrylic they are much more watery much more watery, but they also, they don't dry glossy, they dry matte. That's yeah. what I was looking for. And I don't do a lot of painting, but I have done some acrylic painting. And the thing that I've noticed with buying a name brand, such as Golden's versus, you know, Cracker Barrel or Apple Barrel, I think it's the... It's Apple Barrel, yeah. yeah. the water. Yeah, Cracker Barrel is a different thing. <laughs> um, those, you know, you can get those Apple Barrel acrylics for 50 cents, a little 8-ounce mm-hmm thing of it and a eight ounce jar of titanium white that I got that was gold I think was like $23 or something like that but I think I do want to just stop you there though because there is a difference between the craft and then the fine art like they are in completely different sections because the manufacturers know people are going to use this apple barrel craft paint for like painting a birdhouse or painting you know, a little gnome versus the fine art acrylics. Those are going to go on canvas. Those are going to go on poster boards, whatever, whatever you're working on. So I do want to make that 
that distinction. Yeah, and that is that's something I was going to get to, is that the Golden's Fine Art Acrylic Paint, if you just look at the paint itself next to that craft paint, one of the main things you notice is that that paint, it is buttery. The Golden's, is, it's buttery in its smoothness and its thickness. It is, I mean, you can dollop it out and you can paint with it like if it was a... Um, like impasto painting which is very thick textured you can't do that with the craft paint the craft paint is so watery it just it runs yeah and it's great for putting on birdhouses and things um and it's one of those things where i use the white goldens but i don't use any of the other golden colors i'll just mix some of the craft paint in with that it'll give (laughs) me a thicker paint no i mean that's perfectly fine i have little tubes of golden paint um, say I wanted a light purple, I would just take my small tube of deep purple and mix it in with the white. I do the same thing yeah. to stretch that dollar amount. And that's one of the points I want to get to is sometimes it's worth it for those brand name high-end things. But I think as a, a young artist or someone who's just starting off in their art career, like I want to make art and you're thinking, what should I buy Bob Ross or Golden's? You don't need to. No. You um, need to you need to focus on your skill first. Yeah. Because I mean, as much as I don't like the guy, Picasso could draw like a madman. True. I mean, would I personally use Rose Art pencils? No. I wanna I wanna pay for a little more expensive Prismacolor because I like the way it works more. But that dude could use Rose Art pencils and make it look like the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. You know, like it's. It's worth it to a certain degree, but if you know what you're doing, if you have the talent, if you have the skill that you've honed in over the 50 years that he was able to do it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. You're going to make the lowest quality look like the highest quality. Right. And the thing is, you know, higher end art supplies, a lot of times artists who generally make the leap from average or not even average, but just like your regular base supplies to those kind of higher and more industrial quality or archival mediums is because they are archival. Um, You know, that's the difference between Prismacolor and Crayola. If you get high-end Prismacolor colored pencils, they're archival. The colors that you're using in 50 years should be close to that same kind of hue and quality of color, whereas a cheaper color pencil, a Crayola, might not last. The color itself might fade. And something that if you look at, you know, Van Gogh or Degas, before they had these industrial pigmentations. When they were making their own. own. Yeah. They, I mean, you can look at a Van Gogh, and if you do the research on it, it'll be like, yeah, this brown used to be green or blue mm-hmm. or red, but the colors have faded over the years. And so that's one thing that, you know, artists, as they start to go beyond just... Um, the learning phase, it's usually worthwhile, especially if you're going to be doing commissions for people. Yeah. Um, it's usually worthwhile to look into like, okay, if I do this drawing for someone, I want it to last and last the test of time. So it might be worthwhile at that point to then upgrade to something that is archival. Because what I think of whenever I'm doing a commission for somebody, I'm not just making a piece of work. I'm not just you know, making a gift for somebody, you're making an heirloom in a way. Because what if they, what if you're doing a painting of their family or a drawing of their family or something like that? They might want to pass that down to the kids. Right. And then the kids can then show their kids, be like, oh yeah, this was your your grandparents or something like that. So you definitely want to factor in that archival aspect. Yeah. And, you know, that idea of buying name brand things as well is something that I've dealt with personally as a shop manager um, in the, or a studio manager. You know, when you have a lot of people sharing tools, we don't give them the thousand <laughs> dollar tool. We give them the, you know, $80 tool because so many people are using it. They're not using it the right way all the time. So things can break. And so if you're just starting off, going and buying a you know three thousand dollar paintbrush or power tool i I don't think i've ever seen three thousand dollars dollar, maybe not paintbrush (laughs) but there are professional quality like chisels and gouges yeah um you know things are made out of certain types of steel that have to be maintained and treated in a certain way if you're just starting off you have no clue how to actually use 
that tool to the highest level that it yeah. should be used. My high school art teacher did the same thing. Like when she realized how serious I was, and I wanted to pursue this. She would show me the secret stash of nice paper. Yeah. You know, that really thick grit had nice tooth, wonderful, wonderful thickness. It wasn't just the cheapo. Here's white drawing paper. Have some printer paper. Yeah. <laughs> Which, that was elementary school. I'm talking about high school. High school, we actually used drawing paper. But it was that stuff that you would just get in a regular sketchbook or drawing yeah. pad. Whereas when she realized how serious I was, when I told her I wanted to go to art school, she showed me like how to look for different tooth paper, how you can get different colors and yeah. tones. And that, when you're first starting out, it doesn't matter. But whenever you start to take the time to actually learn what you can do with those, you're right. You can use it to the highest potential. Of yeah. course, the first few times you're not. But as right. long as you're approaching it with like the learning aspect and you're trying to figure it out. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to talk about under the, I guess, the phrase or question, is it worth it? Is it worth it to draw from a live model versus possibly drawing from poses in a book and in my opinion it's absolutely worth it yeah because when you're drawing from a book and that's what i used to have to do before i went to school because you don't have access to live models unless you convince one of your friends to sit for you um but when you're drawing from a picture, everything's flat. You're already seeing it in 2D. So transferring it from 2D to another 2D piece of work, it's not as challenging as when you're drawing from a live model. When you're drawing from a live model, not only are they slightly moving, so you're having to act in real time, mm -hmm. but the perspective is completely shifted yeah. in the best way you get you get more naturalistic poses. You get more naturalistic uh, marks when yeah. you're sketching the the body and the form. I think it's absolutely worth it. Yeah, even just still life, setting something up and drawing from life yeah. is worth it. The other thing with drawing from life is, you know, if you've never taken a figure drawing class, figure drawing classes, I mean, they're essential to honing your artistic eye. The ability to see something and then translate it and understand how it's made up and then understand how to then turn that into a drawing, a painting, or a sculpture. And when you take a life drawing class, the thing I always did is I came in, I had my seat, I'd set up my, get my stuff out, and then when the model would come in and they'd take their first pose, I'd get up and walk around the model and find the best view. I'd find the angle I wanted. Sometimes I'd get on top of a desk so I'd have a downward looking angle, to a better perspective to draw a more interesting drawing. You can't do that with a picture. You're no, you stuck can't. with the the view that the person gave you. And the other thing is, when you're drawing from life, I go left and right as I draw so I can see the totality of the form. Not just I, a flat like uh, shape of what the form is. I can actually see the volume in real time, the way that the light and shadow play across it as I move. That's what I wanted to say. The light and shadow. I loved playing with the different direction that the light is coming from. Because when you're drawing from... From real life, you can change the sun, quote-unquote. Mm -hmm. So you can't do that in a picture. And even if you're just using that as a reference and you want to change it to like a wizard or something like that, so the light source is coming from his wand, figuring out where that light's going to fall is a little more difficult when you're working from a model. You can just move the light. Right. Yeah, and it is very challenging if you're working from, you know, a stock image. And don't get me wrong, I use those all the time. Oh, yeah. Because it's so much easier than calling up my friends and trying to schedule something. Or but, using a mirror where you're like, yeah. now I have to hold my own pose <laughs> and draw. <laughs> but I've done. You have. And I mean, I think every artist has. But if you have the ability to, to, work, take, yeah. to work from a live model, it's so great. Yeah. I miss drawing class so I, much miss having life drawing because blue star and corpus christi did uh once a week they'd have models come in you mean case space yes case space sorry yeah case space and it was open to any artist out in the public who come in there was a small fee um to help mm -hmm. cover the cost of the model because was it nude or was it it was nude oh, okay um and i used to do that a whole bunch 
until school got too busy for me to really break away from that. Yeah. But I, I miss that ability to go and sit down and do life drawing from a nude model. So you Figured said you would, you would move around the room to find the best pose. Uh, I would find my seat, kind of set up, and I always took it as a challenge. Like whatever the, the model's pose was for because she would rotate she would do several poses throughout the class but whatever mo- pose she chose i would use it as a challenge like no i'm here mm-hmm. let me figure out how to do this like it wasn't always the most dynamic and every now and then i would move because i just i hated whatever position i was in but i always took it as a fun challenge like can i do this because this is so the foreshortening is just awful but can i figure it out I try to find. That's why I would move to find like where's the ones with like the crazy foreshortening, right? oh, so I can okay. better understand. Like, oh, so that's how it looks in life, and now I can see better how the shadows play around the form, the volume of the figure, and then try to draw that. We had a model that a lot of times she would fall asleep because it was a night class um, at the community college. They didn't want to do nude model. Life drawing is typically nude models, just for those that don't know. They didn't want to have that in the middle of the day, Mm because there's a lot of chance of, like, people walking in. So, like, so they wanted to keep it private and keep the model um, as, I guess, safe as possible, or as, like... comfortable, too. Yeah, comfortable, and, like, just less chance of them getting walked in on. So, anyway, it was at um, nighttime, or in the evenings, or whatever, so she was always really tired, because she was in school, too, she had a job... And she would always fall asleep in her poses. And I love that because you could see the muscles relax. Yeah. They weren't as as tense. So if she was standing, of course, she was awake. If she might be sitting, pretending to read or something like that, it was fine. Whenever, but whenever she would do a reclining pose, I loved those because it looked so natural. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Your models are not professional models. No, in most school. of the time they're students. They're, yeah, usually <laughs> they're students or people that they found out in the community who are comfortable, you know, doing nude modeling. Yeah. And so expecting them to hold a pose for 30 seconds, it's just, it's unrealistic. Well, 30 seconds is fine, 30 minutes. The, yeah, I guess I should say depending on the pose. Like, if you have their arm out. Yeah, that's true. You know, or if it's in something that isn't, like, very comfortable for them, like a sitting pose, we would always do most of our, depending on the model, if they were a younger person, we might ask them to do a standing pose for a longer, like a 30 minute to an hour, but they take breaks every 15 minutes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, whenever they take a break, they come back, they reset up, and they try to get into the same position, but they never do, and that's part of life drawing is like, I'm never going to be seeing the exact same thing, because the model's always kind of shifting, you have to kind of build that into the way that you approach your drawing and lay it out and set it up. I think that's why it's worth it to keep it on the theme of is it worth it. It's totally worth it to go out there and just sit in a park because people are moving around. People, like you said, they're not just standing still. They're not holding a pose for 30 minutes. So being able to do a quick reference of somebody having a picnic or catching up with a friend or swinging. Yeah. It's, it's so worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Build up those muscles in your arm and shoulder. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the other thing that I miss about being in that kind of setting is, you know, when I draw now or sketch things, I'm usually drawing from references and then like piling things, or doing uh, sketches for, you know, a sculpture later on down the road or those kind of things. But when I did life drawing, I was always standing and I would always draw from the shoulder. So yeah, large, well, they tell speaking, you to do yeah, that. Gestural, gestural marks and strokes to show the movement and the activity and the, the dynamic force of what's happening in front of me through the line. And that's something that, yeah, if you're drawing statically from a reference photo or you're sitting down at a, you know, a desk and you're just doing your Netflix thing and sketching things out, you lose some of that energy. Yeah. Um, energy is a good word. Yeah. Yeah, I miss that too. Let's just, go take a drawing class. It's just like the community aspect. Um, a lot of the models, not just me, but like the class itself, we build a relationship with them. We hear about their day. And even if they did switch, I remember one girl, we had her pose with a um, like a staff kind of thing. It was just a long piece of dowel rod, but we wanted her to like kind of hold it out. 
and she was able to rest it on the ground so mm. she wasn't having to hold it up. But, you know, you slightly turn. Yeah. Especially if you're talking, so it's weird to talk to somebody and not look at them. So she might, like, kind of glance, and then it slowly shifts. Uh-huh. <laughs> and But you build that relationship so you're comfortable being like, hey, can you were, like, two inches to the right. I'm like, oh, yeah. And then she would just switch. Yeah. I miss that community aspect. Yeah. Yeah, life drawing is always worth it. Is it worth it to study the history? Because I remember being asked during my graduation show, because you make a body of work. It's specific to what you want to do. It's, you know, your own story, whatever you want to say. But I remember being asked, well, what what are you referencing? What did you look at from our history? And I was like, I, I did it. And I was kind of taken aback. And, you know, I was an undergrad, so I didn't understand, like, that you should do that. Um, But for me, it was more like, well, this, it's my story. It was my house that burned down. So I'm doing these fractal works. Like, and so whenever they asked me that, I was like, well, I haven't seen any. I'll do research, but I haven't thought about it. So I guess I do feel like it is worth it to look at the history, but... How how important is it to look at it? It's important because as an artist, you are part of a legacy of professionals who have worked in the visual medium or whatever medium you're working in. Is it worth it to look at why somebody created something? Why somebody chose that subject matter? Yes. Because yeah. as an artist, you're part of a legacy of people who have come before you and kind of laid a foundation for the way that we as a culture think and disseminate works of art. And so by understanding how others have done that before you, the concept behind why they did that, you are better informed and better able to communicate through your own work because they may have already had ideas and thoughts about something that you're tangentially talking about similarly. Mm-hmm. You can then be like, oh, wow, the way that he described that thing that I've been trying to figure out is much more eloquent than the words I've been using or the way that he's using these colors to evoke this kind of emotion in his work works really well because he's trying to, because I know he's trying to evoke that emotion because of the concept behind it. And then you can reference that in your own stuff. So other people who know that history, other artists who understand that kind of language can also then latch onto it. And people who don't, they will understand, they'll have that discovery if they look at your work, if they want to take the time to learn about it. Mm. And that depth of making a work of art is part of what makes good art. Not just a work of art, but a good work of art. Something that is culturally significant because you're tying it not just to you and why it's important to you, but to everybody around you and to our culture as a whole. See, and I thought that, like, after I was asked that in my... Because you have to go to a panel in front of all the the teachers, all the professors, I should say. And You're I talking was, about your thesis. Yeah. Yeah. And I was kind of taken aback, and I was like, oh, man, that is important. But I couldn't figure out why. Like, the technical aspect I get, the understanding of how a process works, or just, like, the basics... But I was really frustrated that it was my senior year. I was like, crap, why didn't anybody ever ask me that? Yeah. Like, I should have been studying that this whole, at least this whole past year while I was working on the on the body of work, if not the whole four years so I could figure out who I was as an artist quicker. I mean, the other reason why it's important is so that you don't make the same missteps that those who have come before us have made. Yeah. Yeah. You're not appropriating, culturally appropriating something for your own gain without it, like, having purpose or intent. Um, or misrepresenting something because you didn't do the research. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's one of the, the biggest pitfalls that a young artist can fall into is they see imagery because there's it, it's so easy to access stuff. And you can see stuff everywhere. And you're like, oh, I really like what this one artist did I'm going to use it in my art and then you don't actually look into oh why did they use that where's that from and it turns out that it's actually something that's culturally significant to that other artist and by you just grabbing it and using it 
it doesn't have that significance for you. When people see it, like, well, why are you depicting this? This means this to these well, people. Like, it's like that cradle board at Blue Star right now. There's this beautiful Native American cradle board done by an artist. I wish I could do that. Like, the right. color palette's amazing. The the craftsmanship is on point. If, yeah. if I didn't understand appropriation and I tried to do that, like, that's just really crappy of me. <laughs> right, yeah. So a cradle board is a... Um, a baby carrying device used by Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got two rigid sticks and this little thing that, like a, a backpack, it's like a swaddle little, kind of thing yeah. that holds the infant. infant. But it, her, she has that piece and she has this um, army jacket. But the work's all about uh, Native Americans and kind of dealing with uh, the army. The whole show has to do with uh, people who are in the military and then they're kind of like how they have dealt with being in the military and their cultural response to it. Um, so this is about a Native American who was in the military and she made this cradle board. It's got beadwork and this other stuff that references different aspects of military life. Um, it's, it's so well done. But once again, if me, the white guy, <laughs> yeah. tried to make this Native American cradle board because I thought it was cool, it would not be a good look. No matter how well done it was, yeah. it would still it would be like, well, why? Why? What's the point? Like, oh, I think it's cool. I'm like, okay, but why? What are you trying to say with it? And that's yeah. the thing with artwork is, even if like, I just thought it was a cool thing, so I did it, is people are going to look at what you're doing, and because it's not like a text message or a conversation, it's something that you have to look at and discern, people are always going to be like, well, why did you do this? What's the point of that? What are you saying with that? How does that change the way that we view those things? Because learning that an artist is a specific ethnicity, a specific gender, you know, comes from a certain background or culture, changes the way that we perceive their artwork and understand what they're trying to say and communicate through what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Shinko Yonabara is a, he's English from England, but he's a black man and he does a lot of work about um, the Dutch appropriation of African cultural symbols. So like back in fabrics. In their tiles? In their in dove blue their, stuff? No, in their um, in the fabric. So they took oh. the Batik fabrics, which is where you take a wax resist and dye the fabrics to give them these vibrant colors and patterns. Many African tribes have a much like Scottish or Native American, they have a certain like color and pattern pattern that yeah. denotes their tribal the Dutch saw that, went back to Deutschland, made the same thing but completely fake, and then brought it back there and sold it to them. And so he's kind of playing off of the appropriation that the Dutch did of these kind of tribal African things, and then using them to make European costume and dress. But it's because I think he's English. African and he's also primarily Dutch. Like those are the main. Oh, so he backgrounds. has that nice kind of like, com- not confrontational, but like you've got it's, one foot in each camp, so right. like that kind of split. And it's part of his culture and part of heritage. Where yeah. you know he has a personal connection to it, but he's also talking about this in the larger context. Whereas if I, the white American, did the right. exact same work it wouldn't have the same kind of cultural connotations to be like, okay, so what are you saying about the British? Or what are you saying about, mm-hmm. you know, these things as an American, because my view is different than someone who's, who is English, who grew up in England or who grew up in Africa. Right. I mean, now if you were to do something about Poland, you're right. Polish. So like, even if you, cause you don't know a lot about your Polish heritage. Correct. You don't know a lot of your family over there, but say you were doing the, (laughs) he just mouthed zero at me. (laughs) Say you were doing some genealogy work and you were trying to find that kind of cultural identity. If you were to do work based on that, that's perfectly fine. In fact, I get, I love genealogy stuff. I get so excited about that. So if at that point it wouldn't be like you were doing a far reach you were doing the emotional work along with the artistic work. Right. And the, you know, the thing is it's about me and my Mm -hmm. perspective and view. It's not 
me. It's not me. Oh, if I was uh, Japanese, right? Or not even taking that stuff and using it, but using it in an exploitive way, or saying this is what they mean. Me, the white American, yeah, saying that I don't know that. Like I'm speaking for them by appropriating what they're doing, um, and that's not right. You know, putting your words in someone else's someone else's mouth is never something that you should do as an artist. You should, you know, one of the things that we learn in school that we try to do is be conscious of the way in which we communicate through our art. Communicate is always my favorite favorite thing to say whenever somebody's like well you know what's the point of being an artist why why did you want to be an artist that's how I feel most comfortable communicating that's how I can express myself and converse communication is the most basic human human thing we do we communicate through song we communicate through artwork even just body language I just get really excited when somebody says communicate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the same sense, that's why it's worth it to go to museums. Yeah. Because you're educating yourself about a wide range of artwork. and Museums, galleries. Galleries, too. Both contemporary and historical. Schools. The schools have galleries. And just, like, going to school. Not, not trying to say that, like, everybody should go in debt <laughs> for higher education. But bettering yourself and trying to to learn as much as you can, it's absolutely worth it. Yeah. I and mean, as somebody guess... who has put off grad school for the past five years because I don't want to live in debt for the rest of my life, if, if I could, I absolutely would because it is worth it. Yeah. I mean, I think is higher education worth it sometimes? Um... I think if we had a different structure. If we had a different infrastructure for yeah. how education is 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 done in our country. If everybody could get their associates for free, I would say everybody should get their associates. Yeah. Without a second thought. I mean, if you could get any level of education for free, you should absolutely do it. Just because I believe that learning and educating yourself is always worthwhile. Proving oneself is always worthwhile. But there are times where, like, school isn't worth it. Yeah, taking on that extreme amount of debt for something that you're not passionate about and you're not excited about and you're just, you know, not going to utilize in your life, it's not really, like, it's not really worth it to show up and be like, oh, I'm doing this because I was told go to school. You know, if you want to be an artist, you don't have to go to school for that. You can make art, get it into galleries, start showing stuff. Yeah, you can, there's plenty of online material. Yeah, you can start an online store, Oh, I meant to study, to learn from. And, yeah, and study and learn from. Um, but especially now, I mean, maybe in 1970 or 1980, it would have been more of a thing where like, oh, well, if you really want to learn yeah. the finer techniques, you need to go to school so you can learn from a master. But now, you can find all that stuff online. Yeah. You can set up your own kind of group where you just rotate posing for each other. Yeah. If you want to teach art, you got to go to school. Is it worth it to travel for inspiration? Yeah, travel's always worth it. I do should, too. Yeah, you should always travel. That was one of the downfalls of this episode. We knew we would agree on, like, everything. But I definitely wanted to pose the question out there, just in case a listener hasn't thought of it in that way. Right. I mean, travel's worthwhile because as artists, we're communicating ideas and thoughts and things to people. And so being able to understand other people's viewpoints, where other people live, where they're coming from, helps us better communicate with them. And by traveling, you see, oh, other people don't live like me. Other people, they live in different parts and different cultural norms. You can norms. apply that, too, just to non-artists. Traveling just broadens your worldview. Like, oh, so they don't live in homes made of wood. They live in homes made of rock. Because they don't have to worry about... A sweltering summer, they're yeah. up north where it gets really, really cold, so they want it more insulated. Like, oh, they have basements. Yeah, they have basements. Traveling's always worth it in any aspect. Just getting out of your hometown. Yeah. And that's the other thing. It breaks up the monotony of your day-to-day life and gives you that fresh perspective. 
gives you that fresh perspective you can then bring back with you and give you ideas on ways that you can change and do things differently. Yeah. And again, not just as artists. I, right. You know, I love looking at different color palettes and things like that, but I never was a foodie until I met you and like experiencing travels and going to new places and experiencing the food that's something I never thought of and it's really become a fun thing where we can incorporate that into our into our weekly meals whenever we do return home whereas yeah. I was always just like no what's cheapest and easiest because I'm lazy and I hate cooking I'm going to 7 <laughs> but but you kind of helped open that and so it is it's really fun yeah and delicious <laughs> Yeah, and even if you're just traveling, you know, to different parts of the city you live in or the town you live in, even that helps broaden your horizon, your perspective. You know, I lived in Chicago, and I would go on the weekends to all different parts of that city because there was so much to see and so yeah. much to do. There were little museums and little cultural spots that you could go check out, little places to eat as well. I'm from a really small town, um, so I mean, you could see the whole town in half a day, but my parents would drive us all over the state, yeah. and when they could, they would drive us out of state. We would go up to Chicago as well. We went to Florida and Louisiana, all that stuff, um, Missouri. Yeah. Just whenever you can branch out of your town or your state, if you can. And whenever we do travel, I always get home, and after seeing a bunch of things, it makes me want to get back in the studio. It gives me ideas yes. to make things. You know, the body of work I'm working on now was inspired by seeing a bunch of other artists using woods and different textures of natural and found woods. And I was like, oh, I like that. I like some of the colors and I don't like some of the things they're doing, but I can incorporate that into my lexicon and utilize it. And that happens almost every time I go to a museum. I always come back energized and revitalize. Yeah, part of mine that I'm working on now was inspired by all those great Greek statues we saw mm. in Amsterdam. Yeah. Like, seeing this giant foot and... The torso of Belvedere. Yeah, just seeing, like, these um, amazing figures, thinking about how at one point they were covered in bright colors. How can I incorporate that with my own, my own body of work where it's very much female-empowered and trying to stay a positive female... Um, role role model thank you <laughs> um, how can I incorporate that so yeah travel is like the it's not always the easiest money wise but it, it can be the easiest piece of in inspiration that you do it's fun there's always so many places to go yeah. so many things to see I know we plan one vacation and I'm like here's four more that I want to do <laughs> yeah so I think that's about all we have for today um, we knew it was going to be kind of short yeah but we did want to kind of briefly touch on some of those things because we both think that making art is worth it we both think spending the time to learn about it and just doing it and sharing it with people is worth it i don't think we would be doing this podcast if we didn't think that <laughs> so yeah we kn we knew we would be in agreement in a lot of things but we thought the questions were important just to think about and to always have in the back of our minds. Um, and also, our past two weeks have been really busy, so we haven't been able to research <laughs> really in-depth discussions. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Well, I am Andrew Malcheski. And I am Joanna Bolsons. And hopefully you're still you. Thank you for listening to our podcast. It means so much that you take the time to listen to us. If you like what you hear and would like to help us out, please like, comment, and subscribe. We want to have a conversation, and sometimes and that means that as we talk about things, we might make mistakes, like in the pronunciation of names or the misattribution of statements or a piece of work, and messing up titles and dates. If we do and we notice, we'll put a correction in the show notes, and if we don't, please let us know so we can. We invite you to join the conversation, so please get in contact. Email us your favorite artwork, ask us to explore a specific artist, or ask how something is made. You can find us at www.artsplanations.com. There you can also find out more about us, the show, and each episode. 
You'll be able to find out every artist, quote, and most of the specific vocabulary we use in each episode, as well as a list of upcoming topics. If you are curious about our artwork, the best place to find us is on our Instagram and other social medias, which are linked through the Artsplanation website. We'd also like to thank the Joy Jobs and the Free Music Archive for our music. 